Hello, this is Kara Dreamer, and it's been a long time since I've done this. Uh, I think at least four months, I don't remember exactly. <clears throat> but I have decided to try to resume my weekly practice of reading works of, of fanfic that I happen to like, um, and possibly other types of material too. But uh, the focus of this uh, Wednesday night reading is going to be reading chiefly uh, Undertale and Steven Universe and possibly Night in the Woods fanfic if I, if I haven't uh, been reading anything great in, in that, re that regard lately. But uh, it also, by the way, happens to be the 1st of August, the uh, uh, which is, uh, if, you're, uh, if you're into witchcraft or neo-paganism, you might know this as the holiday of uh, Lamas. And uh, I was going to try to combine some something. I've been wanting to get back into witchcraft more. I've been doing stuff on a, in a small way for uh, about a year now. And um, But uh, life and depression and other things happen today. And, and I, have, I have nothing, absolutely nothing planned. The most that I can... The most that I could say is that I have a couple of little offerings of food and drink uh, on my altar, and I have a, a candle burning uh, uh, to, to goat mom. I will admit uh, there is a plushie of Toriel on my altar. And, um... <laughs> Look, you... <laughs> you... There's nothing explicit in the story... Um, like, this is, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> um, besides Frisk is getting older, uh, you know, they need to know the facts of life, uh, and, uh, anyway, um, so, that being out of the way, I think I'll get down to the story reading itself. Oh, uh, looks like I need to do a couple, a little bit more muting here. Uh, yeah, let's mute that. And mute that. Okay. So, both of the stories that I will be reading tonight are by Word Bending on Archive of Our Own. Or, uh, I also know, <coughs> excuse me. I also know word bending as snack or fork on on uh, Mastodon. Uh, uh, word bending has been uh, uh, has recently concluded a a, a massive uh, fanfic on uh, two characters that are extremely near and dear to my heart, namely uh, uh, Kara Dreamer, uh, my namesake, <laughs> and uh, and Azriel. Uh, a story about uh, how they were young and uh, and all of the uh, adventures that they got up to, and uh, I'll probably be working my way through that uh, pretty soon here. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, it's very long. It's it's novel length. It's it's over a hundred thousand words. So obviously I won't be doing that all in one go, but. Uh, um, so yeah, look forward to that one. That that one definitely is is uh, uh, got some some heavy. It deals with some heavy topics, as you might imagine. Uh, any story that focuses around Car uh, Kara Dreamer uh, to be so. Uh, uh, what I'll be reading today, though, is going to be a bit lighter lighter material. Uh, the first story that I've chosen to read is a Steven Universe story. Uh, set in a, in a series of stories that Word Bending's been been working on every now and again, uh, in which uh, Steven, Steven Universe, is uh, is trans, uh, and she's a trans woman, and uh, you, you see her uh, in the process of, 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 of building a relationship with, with Connie and uh, and and all the, the the things that they get up to, and so this this is a this is a story in that series. I think it's the last one that uh, 
uh, the, the seventh, the seventh of seven stories uh, in this series. I've read previous installments uh, when I when I was, had been doing this some months ago, and uh, um, I can I could put up a link somewhere to I, I have them all on a, uh, on a YouTube playlist, and I'll be adding this recording to that playlist. Uh, so. Uh, uh, if you're curious at all about previous story readings, uh, I, I encourage you to check that out. So, this story is called Under the Collar, and I will now read the summary. Stephen and Connie are adults, and girlfriends, and dating. They have their own apartment now, and they've bought just one single bed. And, in their first night sleeping in it, they're both aware of the implications Unfortunately for Connie, so is Stephen's gem. There are unexpected perils to living with a girl with a magical space rock in her stomach. Um, so yeah, the story is, is, is some adult overtones, uh, and, and uh, word bending has covered this in the notes. Uh, she tells us so. Uh, uh, both Stephen and Connie are adults. Stephen is a trans girl. Nothing explicit happens or is implied to happen, only some extremely mild nudity, extremely unsettled metaphors, and maybe a bit of not extreme smooching. That takes place uh, in the same universe as her universe, and sort of unofficially in the same universe as Nagging Gargoyle's extremely good trans Stephen stories, Equilibrium, which you should definitely read. And uh, I. I haven't read that one yet, and I'll probably be uh, uh, getting to that also uh, as I continue these fanfic readings. And there's more notes at the end, which I will uh, save to the end. So with that, I give you Under the Collar by Wordbending. Change had been a constant thing for Connie Maheshwaran for the almost decade she had known Steven Universe. But, even by those standards, a lot had changed over the past few years. For one thing, she wasn't a little kid anymore. She was an adult, free from her parents, watchful eyes, an adult with her own somewhat rundown apartment. She and Stephen were girlfriends, and, and dating, now. And Stephen was laying next to her in her pajamas, her arms wrapped around Connie in her nightie, pressed close to Stephen's stomach. And Connie understood the implications of all that put together very well. She was so busy thinking about how they were sleeping together, alone, that she couldn't actually sleep. And apparently, neither could Stephen. Stephen was blushing an even deeper shade of red than her gem, and Connie's breath was misting in the frigid air of cheap air conditioning neither one of them dared to move or to speak. Sure, they had, quote, slept together, unquote, before as kids in the same room, even in the same bed, but that was obviously different. They were capital A adults now. And even though they had kissed already, really kissed, something that sent a shudder through Connie to even think about, neither of them had dared to move past first base, to use a metaphor Greg might have used. Connie desperately wanted to turn around, to give her girlfriend a tiny kiss and reassure her that it was alright, that they could just get under a blanket and go to sleep like no normal non-dating adults, and that they didn't have to do anything, and to be honest, she wasn't ready to do anything anyway, and she wouldn't love her any less, and it was okay if Steven ever wanted to do anything, huh? But Stephen's arms felt around her, felt so comforting, so warm, that she couldn't bring herself to. Actually, now that she thought about it, Stephen's arms felt very warm. In fact, Stephen's whole body felt like it was getting warm and warmer and warmer by the second, like she was running a sudden fever, and even Connie herself was starting to feel like she was being steadily microwaved, especially her back. She was even starting to sweat, which made no sense at all, because she could still see her own breath in the air. 
Connie started to turn around to ask Stephen what was going on, and her back pressed fully against Stephen's stomach, against something very hard and very, very hot. There was a horrible noise Connie could only describe as a sizzle, and she instantly felt as if someone had pressed a waffle iron against the small of her back. She yelped loudly and bolted out of the bed before Stephen could get out of very confused, very concerned. Connie? Connie was already out of the room, practically kicking down the bathroom door, tearing off her nightgown to jump into the shower and turn on the water as cold as it would go. She hadn't even bothered to take off any of her undergarments or close the door. The water was freezing, the room was freezing, and in any other circumstance, Connie would have felt incredibly gross and uncomfortable, but right now, she could only feel a sense of relief that her back didn't feel like it was on fire. The water against it still hurt a little, and she reached around to press her fingers against it, and she found that the skin was still tender. She looked out of the shower towards her nightgown on the floor. She wouldn't have been surprised to learn that it was singed. What on earth had just happened? Connie! Connie! Stephen's out of breath, mile a minute voice shouted over the noise of the shower. I I'm so sorry! Are you okay? I'm not coming in. I I'm fine, Stephen. It's okay! Connie shouted back relieved to hear Stephen's voice. She couldn't even think about being mad at her. How could she be mad at someone who responds to her girlfriend suddenly screaming and running into a shower in the middle of the night with a, I'm not coming in? Even though Stephen was probably just as confused as she was, she was still a total sweetheart. Are, are you sure? I'm sure. Stephen went quiet after that. Connie imagined, knowing Stephen, that she'd sat down next to the bathroom floor to wait patiently for her to get out of the shower, probably feeling terrible about herself. Connie wanted to go to her... <clears throat> sorry, Connie wanted to go to her side to give her a much-needed hug, but the water falling on her back had gone from feeling vaguely painful to nice and soothing, and her brain was very demanding that she not leave any time soon second. She still doesn't understand what had even happened. All she'd done was turn to talk to Stephen and she'd rammed right into... Oh my god, Stephen! She said, practically hissing out the next words. Were you... aroused? There was a long pause. Oh my god! Stephen moaned. Her voice, already barely audible over the shower, was muffled. You were! Connie gasped, reeling. She heard a soft whomp from outside, the sound of Stephen probably having flopped over. In spite of her brain's protests, Connie turned around and turned the faucet off before stepping out of the shower, grabbing a towel off the rack and wrapping it around herself. Her bare feet squelching on the tile floor, she walked over to sit down next to the open door, bringing her knees to her chest. Stephen? She tried. Stephen only groaned. Connie coughed awkwardly, feeling the blood rise to her cheeks. It's... it's okay if, if you were. It's nothing to be embarrassed about. That's... never happened to me before, said Stephen's still muffled voice from the next room. She sounded like she wanted to bury herself twenty feet underground. Never? Connie repeated. She blushed deeper. Wondering if she should be, should, be, should be flattered. Never. Stephen's voice no longer sounded like it was coming from under her hands, although it didn't sound any less humiliated. Well, not like that. When we... When we became Stevani, or when we, we kissed, or... Or even just being around you, sometimes I could feel my gem getting warm. 
or it start to, you know, glow, but I didn't think anything of it, really. Connie nodded. She'd noticed the glow under Stephen's clothes, the sense of warmth coming from Stephen's stomach when she had her fingers wrapped in Stephen's curls and Stephen's huge hands bracing her shoulders. The way Stephen would get all sweaty and wobbly like she'd been overcooked. But didn't everybody get that way? Even she got that way sometimes, minus a glowing rock in her stomach, so she just thought it was kind of cute. That makes sense, she said. It, it does? Well, I mean, your gem is like you, right? Connie waved her hands in front of herself vaguely. So I guess it's sort of like if you feel good, it... It feels good? Ugh, what am I saying? No, no, I, I get it. I, I think. But I definitely never hurt anybody with it before. Are, are you sure you're okay? It does sting a little, Connie admitted, resisting the urge to prod that still tender part of her back. Quickly, she added. But it'll be fine. Uh, it's not that bad. So sorry, Stephen groaned, voice muffled again. Really, it's it's fine. It's not like you did it on purpose. Connie paused, thinking something over. She noticed absently that she had started to play with her fingers, her hands interlocked over her stomach. Look, Stephen, why don't you come in? C -c -c come in? Stephen sputtered. I'm in a towel. Connie replied quickly, and I still have my, you know, things on. It's fine. Stephen didn't say anything back. Connie heard a creak of floorboards as Stephen muttered something to herself, her voice becoming closer and then further away and then back again. Was she, was she pacing? Before, finally, the door to the bathroom creaked as it was open the rest of the way. Connie looked up to see a very pink Stephen halfway poking her way into the door frame. No matter how much bigger she got or how many years passed, she still stayed that sweet, innocent 14-year-old kid she used to be in so many ways. It just made Connie love her that much more. Connie rose to her feet and, keeping one hand wrapped around her towel, closed the distance between her and Stephen. Before Stephen could react, she wrapped her other arm around Stephen's waist and pulled her in, walking backwards into the bathroom. Thank you. Stephen looked dizzy, her mouth opening and closing like a fish. Connie giggled, although she wasn't blushing any less herself, especially when she noticed the bathroom begin to fill with a pink light when she felt the warm glow of Stephen's gem so close to her own stomach. See? Connie said. It's fine. Yeah, Stephen stammered, blinking. Yeah, I'm fine. Just fine. Stephen, Connie half chided, half laughed. She wanted to just pull her in and kiss her, but she knew it'd just make it a lot worse. We live together. I'm your girlfriend. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. Right, girlfriend, right. Shutting her eyes tight, Stephen took a deep breath and shook her head. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Then she opened her eyes again, took one look at Connie, and instantly turned a deep shade of red, burying her head in her hands. Stephen! I, I'm sorry! I'm sorry! You're just... You're just really pretty and, and, and naked, and, and I mean... I am not naked, Connie laughed. How they had managed to get this far into their relationship without Stephen spontaneously combusting was beyond her. And you're really pretty too, Stephen. Really pretty. Stephen opened one eye, peering between her fingers. Really? Really, Connie replied, leaning forward and kissing Stephen on the forehead. Connie half expected her to faint, but reassuringly she broke into giggles, lowering her hands to her bright red cheeks.
Connie smiled down at her, but after a moment, looked away, biting her lip. Just how was she po supposed to say what she had brought Stephen in here to say? But, Stephen, she tried. If we're going to live together, I mean, without buying separate beds, we're going to have to deal with this eventually. And I think, I mean, it's... It's okay if you don't, and nothing will change between us, but I think you want this too, right? Stephen glanced away, sighing. Yeah, yeah, I do. Okay, Connie continued, trying another reassuring smile. She wasn't sure it was a good one, the way her stomach was doing flips, but Stephen managed to look back up at her without her brain shutting down, so it was a start. Well, I read that, read once that if you're afraid of something, the best way to get over it is to dive right in. Huh? Stephen's eyebrows both rose. Connie felt Stephen's gem becoming even warming and just even warmer, and just in case, took a step back. Uh oh! But, but only if you're okay with it! Connie said quickly, trying to keep her own brain from going haywire at the very idea of what she was proposing. I'm just going to take this towel off, okay? I'm not going to do anything you're not comfortable with. Uh, no, no, I, I, I'm okay with it, Stephen stammered, although the way her shoulders stiffened suggested she was anything but. She shut her eyes tight, taking another deep breath. You're... You're right, Connie. Uh, I want this too. I want it to be with you. Okay, Connie agreed. Her stomach took a break from doing flips to twist, and Connie took a deep breath of her own, trying to tell herself all the things she'd tell Stephen if the roles were reversed, that she was her girlfriend, that they loved each other more than anything, that she would be the last person in the universe to judge her. Tentatively, she let go of Stephen's waist and took a step backwards from her. Feeling Stephen's gaze burning a hole in her, she steeled herself, shut her eyes tightly, and let go of the hand holding up her towel. With an almost cinematic flare, it fell to the ground in a pile around her feet. Stephen gasped, and automatically, ridiculously, Connie flinched, her brain screaming at her to put the towel back on this very instant. She wanted so much to cover herself, even though store-bought underwear was barely worse than the one-pieces she'd wear to the beach, but her arms stayed glued to her sides, stubbornly refusing to move. She felt a pair of hands grip her own, lift them up, and she opened her eyes, startled. But it was, of course, only Stephen, looking up at her with utter reverence, ear splitting grin on her face, and almost literal stars in her eyes. You're so beautiful, Connie, she said, with that kind of complete sincerity that could only be Stephen's. Stephen blinked, and Connie saw in the corner of her eyes what looked like the beginnings of tears. I'm the luckiest girl ever. Connie's anxieties, her worries of what Stephen might think, that she was all out of proportion with limbs too muscular from tennis and sword fighting, but still that tiny patch of stomach fat she couldn't get rid of, that she didn't shave her legs enough, that her armpit hair was unsightly, that her breasts were too small face too childish for anyone ever to consider her attractive, and never mind the whole dark-skinned Indian girl thing, which was a whole other bag of worms. She could almost feel all of those thoughts fading away like little white butterflies, because Stephen already loved her. And what were most of those fears anyway, she thought, next to what Stephen had to deal with every single day of her life? 
I don't think so, Connie said, smiling softly and brushing a hand over Stephen's cheek. I'm the luckiest girl ever. Stephen let go of one of Connie's hands to rub her eyes, but her smile didn't fade away until she suddenly paused, as if realizing something. When she saw the blush rise back to Stephen's cheeks, Connie had a pretty good idea of what Stephen was thinking. You don't have to take your clothes off, too, she said, as gently as possible. Stephen flinched, closing her eyes, and Connie could tell just by looking that she was going through the exact same thoughts that she had just moments before. So she squeezed Stephen's hand, the one still holding hers. Connie could practically hear Stephen swallow, but she still looked up at Connie, squeezed her hand back, and gave her a small, awkward smile anyway. It's like you said, right? Dive right in? She gave a half-hearted shrug. It's only fair. I don't want you to do anything that you don't want to. But Stephen had that look, that I'm not turning back now no matter what happens look and Connie knew there'd be no changing her mind. So Stephen let go of her hand, although not before Connie could give it one last squeeze, and stepped back on wobbly legs. Connie swallowed a lump in her throat as Stephen reached for the hem of her pajama top, the pink one covered in big red hearts that Connie had once told her she liked. It wasn't that Connie was afraid she wouldn't find Stephen attractive, impossible, or that she was still thinking of her as just a little kid. Super gross. She was just worried for her, afraid this whole idea had pushed things too far, that this was going to make Stephen upset or make her dysphoria flare, or something else too horrible even to consider. Connie opened her mouth to try to talk her out of it one more time, but Stephen yanked the top over her head like it was on fire, nearly catching it under her shoulders, and it was on the floor before Connie had closed her mouth again. Stephen's now exposed gem burned brighter than the cheap bathroom fluorescent lights could ever manage, making Connie wince as the light bounced off the mirror and the shower tiles and turned the entire room a shade of bright pink, only surpassed by Stephen's whole body. Connie blinked, raising a hand to her eyes to look over at her. The heat around her gem had become so blistering that Connie could see it distorting the air around Stephen's stomach, making what Connie realized was actual steam rise up to the air. Without a moment of hesitation, Connie repeated the same thing Stephen had just done with her. She took a quick step closer to Stephen, took her hands in her own, and smiled at her gently as Stephen opened one eye. When she saw Connie, she let out a deep breath, and the air in the room cooled, the pink light fading to a soft glow. Connie took a step back, looking Stephen up and down in a way that she hoped wasn't too forward. It was hard to tell if Stephen blushed when she did, since Stephen was blushing so deeply already, but she heard Stephen's breath catch in her throat. Connie looked at her girlfriend's torso, bare except for her bra, lacy and pink. She remembered how Stephen had to order it online because she'd been too... Oh dear, I'll have to wait for that. Pardon the interruption. meaning to re re replace that with megalomania, but anyway. Connie looked at her girlfriend's torso, bare except for her bra, lacy and pink. She remembered how Stephen had to order it online because she'd been too embarrassed to get it from a store. Stephen's chest was small compared to most women like her, as she'd only started hormone therapy recently, and it was still dotted with a number of unshaved hairs. 
She had much more armpit hair than Connie did, although Connie knew that Connie knew that already, and it had never bothered her once. And Stephen's stomach stuck out from over her pajama bottoms, and what most people would irritatingly, offensively, why do people compare people to food? Call a muffin top. And all Connie saw was Stephen, pure-hearted, blushing, the sweetest, kindest person in the entire universe, the one who'd found her when she had nobody, and given her a friend, a girlfriend, someone she wanted to spend the rest of her life with. I told you, I'm the luckiest girl, she said, Stephen, squeezing Stephen's very warm hands as tightly as she could. You're gorgeous, Stephen. You're, you're my girlfriend, Stephen said, looking away. But there was a smile on her face. Of course you'd say that. I mean it, Connie replied, and she leaned up and planted a kiss on Stephen's cheek. Stephen turned her head back towards her, and the moment she did, Connie closed her eyes and kissed her on the lips. She felt the warmth of Stephen's gem again, this time right next to her bare stomach, as Stephen hesitated, then kissed her back. Stephen put her hands in her hair, and Connie reached up and wrapped her arms around her neck, and the heat of Stephen's gem became a steady pulse, a pleasurable warmth, like her heartbeat. Connie didn't break away from the kiss until Stephen herself did, and she couldn't keep the smile off her face at Stephen's rosy cheeks and wide, wavy smile like a character in a Sunday comic. They kissed so many times, and yet, for Stephen, it always seemed to be the first. Stephen shook her head wildly. Um, do I need to take my pants off, too? You don't have to, Connie replied, giggling, twirling one of Stephen's ringlets in her fingers. Eh, I'm good, said Stephen, grinning. Connie laughed. So, I guess we should go back to sleep then, huh, Connie? We never slept at all, though, she said, the words hardly out of her mouth before Stephen wrapped her arms around her waist and lifted her entire body up into the air, her stomach resting against the cooling warmth of Stephen's gem. Stephen kissed her on the cheek, and she broke out into peals of laughter, kicking her legs, which caused Stephen to let out that, oh, chuckle she loved so much. No burning me this time, okay? said Connie as Stephen walked backwards out of the bathroom and back towards the bed. I promise! I promise! she laughed, spitting herself and Connie in circles until she collapsed with an oomph against their bed, the both of them ending up in a messy pile, Connie laying on top of her. Her gem felt comfortable against her now, like it's almost like its own blanket. She slid a hand down Stephen's sideburns, smiling down at her, but she didn't get a chance to listen to the urge to kiss Stephen again. Stephen did it first, pulling Connie down towards her and kissing her just once, just for a moment. The most chaste kiss Connie would have ever had if it wasn't Stephen she was having it with. Night, Connie, said Stephen. Good night, Stephen, said Connie. And that was how the two of them remained for the rest of the night. And that is the end. And there's one note saying simply, thank you to, Na <clears throat> thank you to Nagging Gargoyle for baiting this fic for me. So that was, that was very sweet. Uh, under the collar, uh, I'm kind of hope, I don't know if there's going to be more, uh, of this uh, her universe material um, that's really up to word bending uh, she's talking about uh, wanting to write a story about uh, uh, Connie and uh, uh, accompanying Stephen as she buys her first bra which would uh, maybe uh, I still think that could fit in with this story after all if if, if, uh, if um, Stephen has been buying all of her bras uh, online, then there, there'd still be a first time for the store to them. Uh, or he could always make it some other article of clothing. The, just, just suggestions, uh, word bending. Uh, anyway, 
From that pair of, of sweet, charming uh, lesbians, I turned to I, another pair of, of, of sweet, charming lesbians. Um, and it's time for some Undertale, yes. Uh, after all, Undertale is sort of the medium I, I, I work in, uh, the, the atmosphere that I breathe every day. Uh, and uh, I'll always be reading uh, uh, Undertale stories uh, to the end of my life, probably, if, assuming people are still writing them when I'm 80. So, um, I had a, a choice of a couple here. I decided to ch pick a, a fairly short one uh, that I haven't read yet. Uh, this one is called Taking the Heat, and in summary it reads in which Undyne learns that fishes and underground volcanoes don't mix well. Pyrus hops to it, and Alphys sprays her girlfriend with a garden hose. <laughs> Thanks, I, I appreciate that a lot. Um, word bending. Uh, oh, and one note for Ivy Snowy. Requested by Ivy for the non-sexual acts of intimacy meme, caring for each other while ill. Thanks so much. With that, I give you Taking the Heat by Word Bending. Uh, and then uh, Mew Mew transfers into her super form. Uh, you know, you know the, the one where there there's a stock animation that's like like way higher budget than, than all the rest of the, the the episode. Yeah, and it rocks every time. I want to be a tr cool, transforming, magical girl, too! Oh, oh, my. Well, that, that's fun to imagine. What? Uh, nothing. nothing. I, I, I didn't say anything on 9. Well, whatever. So, then, well, then what happens? Oh, okay. So, Mew Mew says there's her catchphrase. For the sake of of love and justice I will defeat you and then she she activates her power wait hold on uh huh I'm getting kind of winded uh, uh, where, where are you in in hotland where where else you never know never know when a human might show up uh, hotland don't don't tell me don't tell me you're in your armor. Uh, duh. I, I, I can't go hunting. <clears throat> I can't go hunting humans without it. Undyne? Wait. Is, is that a... Undyne? Uh, uh, Undyne! I, I, I'm coming to get you! D don't, don't, don't you dare! Don't, don't you dare die on me! When Undyne woke up, she found herself lying not on a hot, rocky floor, but on a pleasantly warm, comfortable bed. She wasn't in her armor, either. She was in, of all things, nothing but her underwear. There were bags of ice under her armpits, for some reason. And the human that she swore she'd seen just before she collapsed was nowhere to be found either. It took her a moment, and noticing the giant Mew Mew Kissy Cutie poster on the wall, she realized that she was in Alphys' lab. Surrounding the bed was a small army of giant portable fans with barely any space for anyone to move through them. Rah! She screamed, jumping on top of the bed, barely even mindful of her lack of clothing. The bags of ice fell onto the bed sheets. What? What am I doing here? The human, the human's gonna get away. Belatedly, she realized Alphys was right in front of her and staring at her. Her face was a very, very dark shade of red. She was holding a paper cup, which she promptly dropped, splashing water all over the floor at the bottom of her lab coat. Uh, 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 oh! said Alphys eventually. Y you're, you're up! Alphys! Undyne continued shouting. Did you undress me? 
Alphys's face turned even redder, her glasses fogging up. Her shoulders stiffened as she very awkwardly started to make her way towards the escalator. In a loud, monotone voice, she shouted, I am going to get you some more water. Wait, I, I didn't mean... Undyne tried to say, feeling her own cheeks getting warm, but Alphys was already gone. By the time Alphys returned with a new cup of water, glasses unfogged and face slightly less red, Undyne had sat down on the edge of the bed, her arms crossed. Undyne, you, you, you need to lay down, Alphys stammered. No, I, I'm fine. I need to go fight the human, Undyne insisted. She remembered having seen one just before she'd collapsed. She was sure of it. This is my big chance! Uh, Undyne, there's, there is no, there is no human, Alphys said patiently. I, I, I would have seen them with my c c cameras. And what did I see? P probably a hallucination. Alphys took a seat next to Undyne, and Undyne, for the first time, noticed the chair that was sitting by the bed. How long had Alphys been sitting there? waiting for her to wake up. Now, now please, to drink this. Swallowing her righteous fury just long enough to feel a little bit guilty, Undyne nodded. Alphys, though, didn't hand her the paper cup. He, he, you're probably t -t too weak to hold this, Alphys explained. L let me. Undyne hated to hear she was too weak to do anything, but she uncrossed her arms and nodded again. Alphys walked up to her and raised the cup to her mouth, and Undyne opened it obediently and drank. Once the cup was empty, Alphys threw it into a nearby wastebasket, which Undyne noticed was full of paper cups, and, for whatever reason, broken thermometers. Alphys leaned up as much as she was physically able and pressed the back of her hand against Undyne's head. It immediately let out a sizzle, and with a hiss, Alphys withdrew her hand and started to shake it. S still plenty hot, she said, blowing on her fingers. That's not good. Alphys was confused. What does that mean? Alphys frowned, slowly waving her hands in circles as she spoke. It... it... <laughs> it, it means... It, it means the, the, the magic in you is destabilizing. If, if it keeps up, you, you c could... You, you c could even fall down. Undyne felt vaguely sick. Oh, oh, you, you have, I have plenty of de determination, but, but, but I'm, I'm well, lucky I caught you when I did. Her eyes widened as she seemed to realize she'd said something. I, I, I mean, uh, y you're lucky, lucky of, of course. Undyne didn't know what determination was or why it sounded so important that she felt it needed capital letters, but she knew that Alphys was right. She had been lucky to have had Alphys find her when she collapsed, or who knew what could have happened. And she'd utterly hate to do anything, anything at all, to hurt Alphys. Undyne reached out a hand to reassuringly pat Alphys' shoulder, but she pulled away when she realized she'd probably only burn it. So, what now, Doc? she asked. Now, now you should rest. Alphys said. Uh, I'll, I'll keep giving you water, but you, you need sleep. Undyne scoffed. Sleep was for people like Sans. It wasn't for members of the Royal Guard like her. She barely even used her bed. Undyne, Alphys warned. Uh, okay, okay, fine. Undyne replied, sighing. With a flop, she laid down on one of Alphys' pillows. I'll do it for you, Alphys. Thanks, Undyne, said Alphys before walking off towards her bookshelf. 
Uh, here, I'll, I'll read you one of my f favorite manga... I, I mean, human history b books. That should help. When she returned a minute later, holding volume 12 of Momo's Odd Odyssey, Undyne was already starting to drift off. She had been ignoring it before, but now that she was alone, she'd noticed just how hot it was in the room, even with all those fans running. It was enough to make Hotland feel like a nice dip in waterfall. S so, l last volume, Motaro had, j had just activated her, her Walkman, she started to say, and... and Paula, or, or um, Para, de de depending on your tr translation, had, had activated her Walkman and was, was going to f fight her. As Alphys continued to talk, Undyne continued to drift off further and further. She was barely keeping her eye open. Uh, yare, yare, dadaze, said Alphys, showing the page she was on. Where a young, big-eyed human, in what was probably supposed to be a school uniform, was pointing at a young, big-eyed human with prayer beads around her neck. You're, you're two thousand years too early to fight me! Undyne fell asleep. Suddenly, Undyne found herself being sprayed with water. In the face! She sputtered, sitting up from the bed, which for a minute was completely soaked, but the bed simply absorbed the water like a sponge. <laughs> Alphys turned off the guard nose she was holding aghast. I'm, I'm, I'm so, so sorry, she wailed, clenching her hands together. You f fell asleep, and, 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 and I, th I, thought, I, I thought you wouldn't get up again. You told me to rest! Alpha scratched the back of her frills. Oh, ye yeah, uh, uh, I did. Undyne shook a fist. What the heck, Alpha? But, 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 but you still need to be reg regularly sprayed with water, Alpha insisted. I, I read it online, and, and, and I, I figured, you, you know, you being a fish and all, and... Not, not to mention I couldn't take you outside. You'd, you'd burn up again. That's that's why I, I, I b b built and, and installed the conveniently water-absorbent mattress made entirely out of sponges. Undyne sighed. All right, all right, fine. You win. Uh, um, anyway, Alpha said, handing her a towel. Undyne gratefully took it and wiped the water off her face. Once you um, get dry, uh, I have a treat. Undyne didn't have ears, but if she did, they would have perked up. Oh yeah? Uh, yeah, that, 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 that pink stuff you like. The, the one that's definitely not uh, ice cream. I'm... Um, she shyly scuffed a foot against the floor, which... Undyne thought might be the most adorable thing ever known to monster kind. Uh, actually brought to two bowls. To share? Undyne said immediately. Well, well Alphys replied, waving her hands wildly. J -j Just in case you, you might might be, um, hungry? Yeah, or, or um, maybe to, to share? Undyne grinned, not even caring about Alphys' flimsy excuses. Hell yeah! What flavor? Seagrass. All right, my favorite. Alpha smiled, her tail wagging. C great, I'll be right back with it. When Alpha returned with the seagrass-flavored pink stuff, Undyne dug into it like she hadn't eaten in days. Which, well, she might not have. She had no idea how long she'd been out for. Oh, man, this this is del- Oh, sorry, wrong voice. <laughs> oh, man, this is delicious, Alphys! Alphys swallowed the bite she was eating and smiled back at her. F thanks I I'm, re I'm really glad you like it. Like it? I love it! How do you make this stuff, anyway? 
Uh, well, well, it's it's kind of a complicated process. Alpha started to explain, but first I go into waterfall and uh, Undyne though zoned out during the whole thing and just continued devouring the contents of the bowl. She didn't understand a word of what Alphys was saying anyway, but she just liked hearing her talk. When Papyrus burst up the downwards escalator in Alphys' lab, he was carrying a bouquet of flowers that didn't even grow in the underground, and a blue balloon saying, Get well soon, which Undyne also wasn't sure where he'd picked up. I, the great Papyrus, have n of course never once gotten sick, he said, but... As we are friends, I nonetheless wish you all the best in your recovery, Undyne. Uh, as a friend, me too. Undyne looked past Papyrus. Standing behind him was Sans. Oh, that was Sans's voice, okay. Alright. So, I, I, so, it's Sans who says, Um, uh, as a friend, uh, me too. Undyne looked past Papyrus. Standing behind him was Sans, carrying a single echo flower, which repeated his deadpan, Me too. We are not friends, said Undyne. Why, Undyne, I'm hurt, said Papyrus. I thought we were already besties. Not you, Paps, Undyne shouted. I met him. Sans merely shrugged. Hey, maybe someday. Hey, said the echo flower in his hand. Maybe someday. Aren't you supposed to be working? Undyne asked. Yes, said Papyrus, squinting at him. Actually, Sans, now that I think of it, when did I tell you I was coming? Sans winked. I had a gut feeling. Was that a skeleton pun? That was especially terrible. You didn't even tickle my funny bone. <laughs> Ugh, Undyne groaned. Suddenly, Alphys pushed past Papyrus, carrying another paper cup full of water. Uh, that, that, that's uh, enough commotion, you two, she said. Uh, Undyne needs rest. I need to find that human I told you about on the phone. Al Undyne said, waving a finger at Papyrus. Hop to it! Papyrus saluted. On the double! No, the triple! And you! Undyne continued, waving her finger at where Sans had been. But he was already gone, the only proof of him having been there, the Echo Flower, still repeating every word they were saying. Whatever. Forget it. Well, I will take my leave then, said Papyrus, setting his bouquet of flowers and his balloon on the floor next to the echo flower. Rest assured, online, I will capture this human! And then he started to hopscotch out of the room and down towards the upwards escalator. When he finally left, Alphys turned to Undyne, giving her the cup of water. Undyne's hands shook a little as she lifted it to her mouth, but she was still able to drink it. Uh, why why did, did, did you tell him that he saw a human anyway? Alphys asked, frowning. I t told you, it, it was pr probably a, a hallucination. It keeps him motivated. Undyne answered simply as when she'd finished off her cup. Uh, not that he really needs it, but honestly, you know what? I just like seeing him happy. Alphys placed the back of her hand against Undyne's forehead, and this time, it didn't sizzle. Alphys let out a sigh of relief and took out a thermometer, placing it in Undyne's mouth. You're, you're still running a fever. Alphys said once the thermometer beeped and she looked at the results. Well, I, I think so. You are a fish. You, you pr probably just need to stay in a c cool environment for a, a while. So, I'm free to go! Undyne shouted, nearly tackling Alphys as she launched forward and wrapped her arms around Alphys' neck. Hell yeah! Alphys's cheeks turned bright red. Uh, 
Well, well, I, I um, I didn't um, say that, she muttered. But, but, if you really want to, I, I suppose it couldn't hurt. Oh, Alpha! Sorry, Alfie! Are you gonna miss me? Undyne teamed, grinning. Teased. Oh, Jesus, I can't read. Undyne teased, grinning. Just as she expected, Alphys' body stiffened up in her arms. Uh, 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 no, of course. Uh, 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 of course not, Alphys said quickly. Uh, I mean, uh, of course I will. I, I mean... She laid her head against Undyne's shoulder, clearly defeated. Oh, oh dear. Aww. Alphys, I'm sorry. Undyne cooed, not letting go of the hug for even a moment. She patted Alphys' shoulder. I'm gonna miss you too, you know. This is the most awesome sickness I've ever had! Uh, really? said Alphys. Yeah! I had a ton of fun! Uh, well, I'm glad, but, but, but promise me. Promise me you won't to do this again? Fine! Undyne broke away from the hug, put one arm over her chest, and raised the other one into the air. I solemnly swear on my honor as a royal guard that I won't run around Hotland in my armor again. Alphys looked relieved, though Undyne wasn't sure how much Alphys really believed her. Uh, thank you. Speaking of which, where is my armor anyway? Alphys is a... Uh, Alpha smiled sheepishly. Uh, oh, th that. I, I, I might have l left it in Hotland. What? Alpha raised both hands. I, I, I couldn't. I, I couldn't carry you in it. Undyne buried her face in her hands. Oh no! It's probably goop by now. When they went back to Hotland, Undyne wearing one of Alphys' spare Mew Mew Kissy Cutie brand pajamas, they discovered that Undyne's old armor was, indeed, a pile of magical goop. Oh, oh. It, it must have just destabilized the heat, Alphys sighed, poking at the mess of the claw. Oh, I'll, I'll make you a new one, Undyne sighed. I really like that armor. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry. Oh, Alphys, it's okay. I know you didn't mean it. Undyne grinned. Besides, I'm sure your next armor will be kick-ass. Oh, uh, well, well, well we're, we're here, said Alphys, suddenly standing up. I, I, I want to, to, to show off my new w invention. Oh, yeah? Undyne said, her eye widening. What is it? You'll, you'll see, Alpha said, walking away from the lab and towards the bridge leading to Sans' sentry station. Undyne followed behind her, curious. The two of them shortly arrived at a moderately large white device. It had a giant container filled with water at the top of it, two red and blue faucets at the bottom, and a row of little paper cups attached to a dispenser on its right side. Undyne stared at it. What is it? I call it, Alphys announced proudly, waving her hands towards it, a water cooler. It, it um, keeps water cold, uh, obviously, but it even keeps it cold in the scorching temperatures of Hotland. With this, you can safely stay in Hotland for l longer periods of time. Undyne gasped. Really? Yeah. You you made this for for me? Undyne said, nearly crying. Th that's right. Once again, Undyne nearly knocked Alphys over, hugging her. Thanks so much. You're the best, Alphys! In Undyne's arms, Alphys beamed. I should get sick more often! Undyne added. 
but please don't. <sighs> and that is the end. Uh, the end of <laughs> a very amusing story, and one that, that supplies us with a bit of Undertale continuity. Now we know why Alphys made that water cooler. That was taking the heat by word bending, and there's just one short note. Thank you to my friend Skirmisher for taking a look at this fic for me. Uh, hello, Skirmisher, who has uh, been following me. And, um, yeah. <laughs> well, it's sort of like my my, my, uh, my fic that uh, that Alphys met Death, which uh, I also work into canon, so, uh, yeah. Um, uh, well, that was really good, and, uh, like, I was, um, I wasn't sure whether that was going to be a... a like a, a sort of past or, or future Alfine story. It looks like it was a, a past one, kind of an interesting flashback, you could say. And uh, um, yeah, <laughs> gotta gotta love the, uh, the that you know, Alphys basically in, invented a, a, a mattress uh, just because Undyne was sick. I mean, I guess I guess she can do that. And uh, so you know. <laughs> That was really cute. Thanks a lot, uh, Word Bending, for, for writing these. Uh, I think you're a fantastic writer, and uh, I, I really look forward to reading more of your work here. And, uh, um, well, that's going to be it for now. I'm not sure when I'm going to be broadcasting next. At the very latest, it will be a week from now. Uh, might as well make Wednesday night kind of the, the night for these things. Uh, and, um, I haven't decided what, what particular stories I'll be reading. I'll, I'll probably be reading at least one more by word bending, uh, since she's got uh, a few others, uh, and, and there's there's home to get through uh, at some point. So um, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really glad you that you liked them, and uh, I'll try to do a little bit smoother a job next time. I think I got a bit rough there towards the end. Uh, anyway, uh, well, this is Cara Dreamer. Uh, saying good night and uh, have a good have a good day or evening, friends, and stay determined.